good morning everyone the discussion today will mainly focus on the basic notions of stylistics you understand that the basic notion of stylistics even literary stylistics is that of style we speak of style in different areas or fields of studies like in architecture in painting in clothes in human behavior manners and in every kind of work that we do style is in its most general sense is a specific characteristic of human activity arising as a result of choice within the accepted norms within the definite mood or manner of conducting this activity you remember aristotle in poetics talks about the imitation as the basis of any kind of literary representation he talks about the means medium mode of imitation so stylization of such imitative activity with reference to literature shall be discussed today style is indicative of the persons or artists role in society as well as role as a literary artist of the role that is specified within that social group to which she belongs or strives to belong it also includes some individual features the psychological states as well as the tradition this word style has been used in many senses and has led to some kind of ambiguity so it has been understood as a mark of character so we have the physiognomy of the mind suggesting what the writer style wears in the field of narratology we find that style is product of individual choices and pattern of choices so among the linguistic possibilities that are there for a writer we have the question of choice that means what are the things what are the elements or materials of language that the writer intends to select and this selection is to serve an aesthetic purpose after selecting the vocabulary for expression the literary artist arranges them through deviation as well as patterning so this gives a variety or distinction to the use of language especially the use of vocabulary phraseology construction so there are different varieties of language used by a literary artist expressive and evaluative properties of language come out through such expression mainly the speech act and communication so style is a set of features of a kind of text that is finally created by the writer as a concrete text and once we get this text for analysis we go for an anatomy of the constituent features we try to see what are the characteristic features of individual style what are the functional style of a language how the information is conveyed from the composer of the text to the audience of the text whether the style that has been used in the text is an official style formal style informal style even a style, scientific document contains some specific style it may be a colloquial style in the daily day to day conversation or it may also be a literary style so we are primarily concerned with the literary style that is used by the writer so it is a kind of norm based on the phonetic morphological lexical and syntactical pattern that is used by the writer to make language in action more perceptible to the audience style is a deviation from the norm it is a concept that is used traditionally in literary stylistics so anything that deviates from the norm attracts the attention of the readers and through this the artistic foregrounding can be done stylistic foregrounding works on different patterns 
my discussion today primarily will focus on the use of style as far as the phonological components are concerned. In the field of phonology, we know that we have identified the segmental features and the suprasegmental features. By segmental features, I talk about the phonemes and their basic characteristics. In the suprasegmental features, I talk about the use of such phonemes in connected speech with the help of the accent, intonation, the rhythm. In phonetics, we also deal with the production, transmission, and reception of the phonemes. The production of the phonemes that is in our course referring to the articulatory phonetics is supported by organs of speech that produces different phonemes. In English RP, we have 44 phonemes of which 24 are consonantal and 20 are vowels. And we also find that these phonemes are then organized as syllables with the help of clusters, consonantal clusters, and then these are shaped into words. In the form of articulation, the sound that is produced contains variations in pitch, melody, stress, even the pause that is there, the silences that occur within the articulated sounds. Unlike Indian languages, English language has an isochronic stress pattern. That means there is an equal time gap between two stressed syllables. And this makes the English language more rhythmic. In case of Indian languages, we have a syllable timed rhythm because all the syllables receive accent. English language, therefore, has some impact on the audience through the arrangement of the sounds of the phonemes. Say I'm whispering or I'm using some onomatopoeic words to suggest the sound pattern. And if I'm doing so, I can reveal through the sound the content of the text. In English, however, these onomatopoeic words are not abundant. Apart from a few onomatopoeic words, most of the words that we find in English language do not have that relationship between the sound of the word and the meaning of the word. Apart from that, onomatopoeic words, we also have words with the consonantal structure. You know, consonants give variety to a speech. While the vowels are cardinal sounds, they are essential for the production of syllables, production of words. The consonants give some kind of flavor to the, to the text, to the sounds produced in a text. So when we read or go through any kind of literary text, we read that as a speech act with first impression being formed on the basis of the sounds that are produced. So onomatopoeic words that are used in language try to evoke the auditory sensation and appeal to our ears. But apart from these few onomatopoeic words, English language also has several other words that contain the organized form of language. So in phonological analysis, we are mainly to focus on how the phonemes are organized in a text. In the choice of words, phonemes become very important. And according to the sound structure of a word, usually the writer appropriates the word within the context. So stylistics will focus on the use of phoneme in order to understand the intention of the writer to foreground the state of mind through the writing, through the creative work. In so many poems, we find that writers have consciously used the form of clustering of sounds in order to produce the desired effect on the mind of the writers. The main unit of the phonological level is, of course, phoneme. So it can differentiate meaningful language units 
but also has no meaning of its own. Say if I articulate the sound talk, they do not have independent meanings of their own. So the sphere of sound symbolism claim that the sound and the sound clusters have, of course, a strong association with the meaning. So the onomatopoeic words contain such phonemes that simply reveal the inherent content. We also have some words like say, slime, slosh, sloppy, slug, sluggard, slush. Say a line of Parswat, a slumbered hit my spirit seed. So here we have an alliteration of the sound sir clustered with la sound in order to produce an evocative rest. So words like slow, sloth, slang, sly, slush, slack, although they do not contain the meaning in itself, they reveal the inherent content. The patterning of the sounds in onomatopoeic words therefore reveal the intention of the writer. And the choice of the particular sound also reveals what type of environment the writer is planning to create and address the attention of the readers. The onomatopoeic words are to be analyzed in literary text on the basis of the sound produced by the words and the contribution of such sounds in the overall structure of meaning. For producing particular onomatopoeic effect on the mind of the writers, usually the use of consonantal clusters become very important. Say the sibilants that writer uses in literary text, sibilants are produced with the help of sounds like sa, sh, z, z, j. So clustering of these sounds produce the desired effect on the mind of the readers. In William Shakespeare's sonnet, we have the use of this patterning of the sibilant sounds to evoke the peaceful rest. When to the sessions of sweet silent thoughts, I summon up remembrance of things past. I sigh the lack of many a things I sought with old woes, new veil, my dear time's waste. So you must have observed how the writer has consciously selected such words where we have the prominence of the sibilance. And through this smooth flowing sound of the sibilance, we have the creation of the desired meaning. A meaning that talks about remembrance of things past, recollection of the images of the past. So that e emotional tranquil state of mind is produced with the patterning of the sounds. This patterning of the sound, onomatopoeic sound, is also based on the use of other sounds like nasal sounds. Nasal sounds will produce the desired effect of mourning, moaning, nostalgia, longing, so ma, na, ang, these are the three nasal sounds in English RP. When these sounds get prominence, we have this production of nasalized sounds. Another form of sound is the liquid sound, the use of liquid sound. Liquid sound, when it is combined with sibilants or nasal sounds, can sometimes produce the desired effect. Say the use of the la sound, liquid sound la, in Shakespeare's famous song from A Midsummer Night's Dream. Just notice the effect of this sonority of the sound arrangement on the mind of the readers. So when we recite the lines and we follow the lyricism of the lines, the sound le becomes very prominent, creating a kind of impression on the mind of the readers. in Melody sings a la la vi la 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 vi la 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 vi. So this kind of patterning of the sound has to be 
marked and the intention of the writer has to be seen. In some cases, we also have the onomatopoeic effect produced by the use of harsh consonantal sounds. Such harsh consonantal sounds disturb the evocative rest that has been produced by liquid sounds or nasal sounds or the sibilants. And with the use of such harsh consonantal sounds, the jarring effect on the mind of the reader is produced. Say, for example, Wordsworth, while describing a waterfall, uses the following line. The cataract blow the trumpets from the steep. You must have marked the use of the harsh consonantal sounds in creating the sound imagery of the mighty waterfall in that particular line. So we have the sound of cannons in Tennyson's poem. Cannon to the right of them, cannon to the left of them, cannon in front of them, volleyed and thundered. So the sound is captured with the use of the harsh consonantal sound produced by ta, ta, da, ta, pa, ka. the plosives are used. So we have in English RP, the use of different plosives. When these plosives are combined with the alveolar sounds, they produce the harsh consonantal effect on the mind of the readers. So naturally the readers are attracted to the sound structure, the imagery of sound. We know that heard melodies are sweet, but those unheard are sweeter. But the poet cannot take the risk of not writing anything. When the poet has to write something, he has to create the melody, the rhythm of the content. And this rhythm depends on a versification. So versification is the art of writing poetry, keeping in mind certain rules based on language regularities, as well as the poet's experience of the language. Words were defined poetry as a spontaneous overflow of powerful emotion that takes it origin from emotion recollected in tranquility. I repeat, spontaneous overflow of powerful feeling that takes its origin from emotion recollected in tranquility. So once that tranquil state of mind is achieved and the recollection of emotions has been totally carried on by the writer, there is a spontaneous overflow of powerful feeling. Such a powerful feeling impresses upon the mind of the readers only on the basis of the phonological sound pattern, the rhyme, the rhythm, the versification. So rhyme is also a, an artificial poetic form that gives the phonological effect on the mind of the readers. So in case of rhymes, we have so many good examples. For example, in Keats's poem, La Belle Dame Sans Mercy, we have this evocative use of the rhyme pattern along with rhythm and the use of the onomatopoeic words in order to represent the theme. Such onomatopoeic words are kept at the backdrop while the poet describes the, the environment or atmosphere of frozen sterility. The narrator meets this knight at arms who is standing in a state of frozen sterility on the side of a lake. The narrator asks, using the same rhythm of the, of the liquid sounds in a very lyrical, musical manner. Oh, what can ail the night at arms, alone and palely loitering? The such has featured from the lake and no birds sing. What can ail the night at arms, so haggard and so woebegun? The squirrel's granary is full and harvest is done. So you must have observed how the poet is using the evocative rest produced by the use of liquid sounds, le sound, and contrasting that with the impact on the mind of the readers of the frozen landscape with the help of harsh consonantal sounds. Even the sound that are nasal are used by the poet in order to create this atmosphere. The narrator continues, I see a lily on thy brow with anguish moist and fever dew, and on thy cheeks a fading rose fast with her too. 
Wordsworth, however, said that there is no essential difference between the language of prose and language of poetry. Oldridge objected to this definition of poetry and said that the essential difference between the language of poetry and the language of prose is that poetry is metrically composed. Even if you are using the language of prose, the language should be in a proper rhythm. So with the help of the rhyme or rhythmic parallelism, the poet actually converts the apparently prosaic line into a poetic line. So Wordsworth is writing the prosaic lines in his poems. Behold her single in the field, your solitary highland lass, ripping and singing by herself. Stop here or gently pass. So even in these lines, although dramatized as speech act, almost prosaic in appearance, we have the use of rhyme and rhythm. The lines are, of course, metrically composed. Wordsworth also talked about this form of composition through a process of filtration. While he says that my intention will be to, to, to choose incidents and situations from common life and to use as far as practicable the real language used by men. So the real language that is used by human beings, the language used by her in the text also reveals the natural rhythm of speech. English language is isochronic and this isochronism, the equal time gap between two stress syllables, has a tendency to produce some metrical compositions like iambics, trochaics, anapestic or dialectic, dialectic, dactylic meter. And through such patterning, we find that there is an equal gap between two stress syllables. Say Wordsworth, while writing this line, a slumber did my spirit seal. We have the prominence on particular syllables. And these prominent syllables are uttered in a rhythmic manner. There is equal time gap between two prominent syllables. A slum uh, did my speed red seal. You can observe the pattern that is there, equal time gap between these two stress syllables or say unstressed syllables. Unstressed syllables are hardly, hardly audible while there is more emphasis on the accented syllables in the line. Therefore, this kind of linguistic rhythm is produced by the use of the arrangement of language in a metrical order. So Coleridge stated that there is an essential difference between the language of poetry and language of prose because poetry is metrically composed. And we find that even in free verse that is experimental used by so many writers like T.S. Eliot, we have this implotment of metrical schemes and patterns. Same the love song of J. Alfred Prufrock that almost uses the rhythms of prose. We have the, the phonological arrangement of the prominent syllables in such a manner that it will produce its own natural rhythm. T.S. Eliot was experimenting with the jazz rhythm, very contemporary in the early 20th century, to make his poetry more appealing to the general masses. Contemporary readers did like the rhythmic pattern that was used in Eliot's poems. Therefore, the phonological pattern in Eliot's poem differs from that of, say, Coldridge or Wordsworth, but also captures the rhythm of contemporary language. So the vocabulary of ordinary conversation is reorganized in case of poetry in order to create some metrical structures and impress on the mind of the readers. Such metrical compositions are, of course, artificial. They are not natural. So we do not speak naturally in rhyme or rhythm. But in the extreme states of emotion, when the feelings are fully expressed, we tend to speak in rhyme and rhythm. So this tendency of the poetic utterance to move towards the rhythmic expression or metrical expression comes from this natural instinct of human beings to be musical. So music is the source of human civilization. And from music, gradually develop the concept of literature. So if music is the source of literature, 
and literary stylisticians have been using such elements of music or melody to create some kind of utterances that arrest the attention of readers. We can say that the writers are deviating from the norms. And by deviating from the norms, they are also patterning the sounds in such a way that they can impress on the mind or the ears of the readers. Say in drama also, we have such usage of lines. I gave the example of Macbeth's famous soliloquy, tomorrow and tomorrow and tomorrow creeps in this petty pace to the last syllable of recorded times. And all our yesterdays have lighted fools, the way to dusty death. Out, out, brief candle, life is but a walking shadow and a poor player that struts and frets his hour upon the stage and then is heard no more. It is a tale told by an idiot, full of sound and fury, signifying nothing. So you must have observed the organization of the line. Although Shakespeare was writing, composing his lines in blank verse without any kind of rhymes, the dominance of iambic pattern can be seen in his poems too. In his plays, he has used soliloquies, say, for example, in Hamlet, to be or not to be. You can find the rhythmic parallelism by the repetition of the same phrase organized in such a manner that we have the dominance of the iambic pentameter lines along with the dominance of the metrical pattern, although the rhyme scheme is not maintained in blank verse. So to be or not to be, that is the question. Whether it is nobler in mind to suffer the slings and arrows of outrageous fortune or to take up arms against the sea of troubles. So such oratorial or rhetorical statements always contain a conscious use of the phonological structures. So we have perfect rhyme, we have imperfect rhyme. In Shakespeare's sonnets, for example, we have the rhyming couplets. Even modern poets like say Kenneth Brooke, Buck in the habit of imperfect rhyming talks about this, how the rhyme keeps on innovating itself in the works of the best poets. So lips now rhyme with slops, hips with blobs, passion with nuclear fission, and beauty with shoddy. The word that the word for lovely Lisa school is now in the line with urban sprawl. So contemporary lyricism can be seen in Eliot's poems. So the poem begins with a prosaic, let us go then you and I when the evening is spread against the sky. Like a patient etherized on a table, but soon we find that the poet is more inclined towards improvising the situation in a very dramatic manner, where this dramatic moment is captured with the help of, of rhythmic parallelism, rhyme, and the metrical arrangement. So the revelation will lead this proof of to recognize his growing age in such musical or lyrical lines. I grow old, I grow old, I shall wear the bottoms of my trousers rolled. In the room, women come and go, talking of Michelangelo. So you can find this rhythmic parallelism in the composition of the lines. So although the poem begins in a prosaic manner, soon we find that there's an abundance of lyricism, metrically composed lines that actually foreground the urban realities of this metropolitan existence of J. Alfred Prufock. So rhyme is used by the poets and occasionally by prose writers to produce sounds appealing to the reader's senses and to unify and establish uh, poems stanzaic form. So there are different forms of rhymes. You must be aware of these different forms of rhymes that are used in the writings. So rhyme scheme is used in sonnets. There are different types of rhyme schemes, the Petrarchan rhyme scheme, the Spenserian stanza scheme, or Shakespearean stanza scheme. So we have such rhyme scheme based on the repetition of the last sound. So rhyme scheme is not based on the alphabet, rather it is based on the phonological component of the last sound. So if the line ends with say, the first sound is ta, and if it is repeated in the next line, the last sound ta, then we have the coupling of the sounds called couplet. So these couplets we find in so many traditional poems or poetic forms. 
from the Persian, Arabic, Hindu, Hindi, Hindavi poems, we have this use of duha or the couplet. So, bada hua to kya hua, jasan peer khazur, pangti ko chaya na de, full lage ati dur. So, khazur and ati dur, they are rhyming in a kind of duha. Alexander Pope produced some of the finest couplets. Some of these couplets composed in iambic pentameter lines are also called heroic couplets. He also composed some triplets. So such a use of rhyme is common in poetry. You understand that rhyme is not natural. Although in dramatic texts like say Hiro Prajat Deshi, we have the use of the rhymed dialogues. So in the poetic form, we have the use of such rhymed dialogues, but these are used in order to arrest the mind of the readers. In mock heroic verses of Alexander Pope, the same heroic couplet has been used for the mock epical purpose. The use of the anticlimax or bathos can be seen in Alexander Pope's lines. Say in Alexander Pope's opening lines of the rape of the lock, we have the repetition of the sound A in the words obey and decay. We also have the same repetition of sounds in a couplet form in most of the lines of, of Alexander Pope's The Rape of the Log. Say, for example, this simple description of Belinda rising at afternoon or say at the time of noon. So Alexander Pope is writing, Saul through the white curtain shot a timorous ray and over the eyes that must, that must eclipse the day. So ray and day, these are rhyming. So we have this use of rhyme or end rhyme. This is called end rhyme in so many lines. So end rhyme is a rhyme used at the end of the line to echo the end of another line. Say in Tennyson Seagull, you remember this poem, very common poem. You have read this poem in our school days. The poet is using end rhyme for a perfect representation. Although the eagle is situated far away, we cannot hear the sound of the eagle. Yet the lyrical lines produces the effect on the mind of the readers. So Tennyson is writing, he clasps the crag with crooked hands, close to the sun in lonely lands, ringed with azure world he stands, the wrinkled sea beneath him crawls, he watches from his mountain walls, and like a thunderbolt, he falls. So you must have observed the use of triplets. So three lines have the similar sounds, hands, lands, stands. They are the end sounds, end rhyme of these lines. Similarly, the sound crawls, walls, and falls. They also produce a kind of triplet, having a kind of coherence. So the selection of the word becomes very important in such composition. We also have such rhymes produced by the writers that are there in the line, within the line. So these are called the interior rhyme used within a line. For example, Shakespeare is using, hawk, hawk, the lark at heaven's gate sings. So in this, we have the repetition of the sound in the words like hawk, hawk, lark, so we have this type of internal rhymes. Internal rhymes have been classified on the gender basis as masculine rhyme. That means the sounds that contain some kind of strong consonantal sounds and feminine rhymes. Feminine rhyme is also called double rhyme, where we have two syllables rhyming. So we poets in our youth begin in gladness then comes to us in the end despondency and madness. So here we have the repetition of gladness and madness. So this rhyming of gladness and madness having two a set of syllables being repeated, adness, adness. Okay, so these two sounds are repeated. These are called feminine rhymes. So coupled together, double rhyme scheme is used. On the other hand, the masculine rhyme in which two words end with the same vowel consonant combination, like in Tennyson's poem that uses masculine rhymes, the use of stands, the use of 
the sounds like hands, lands, stands, monosyllabic words that are repeated, or crawls, walls, walls. Here we have the same cluster. So the cluster is C, C, V, C, C. So the same cluster is combined and repeated in the sounds. So through this, we have an impact on the mind of the readers. For example, in William Blake's poem, the angel that presided over my birth, we have the use of masculine rhyme. So poet is writing, the angel that presided over my birth said, little creature formed of joy and mirth, go love without the help of anything on earth. So in the nursery rhyme, like say twinkle, twinkle, little star, we have the use of the same masculine rhyme at the end. So twinkle, twinkle, little star, how I wonder what you are up above the world so high, like a diamond in the sky. So we here we have the repetition of the sounds, the vowel and the consonant clusters that are repeated, forming a kind of masculine rhyme couplet. So in Tiger, Tiger, Burning Bright, there is of course a deviation. And consciously this deviation has been used to foreground the important comment that Blake is trying to make. So we have tiger, tiger, burning bright. Bright has this cluster, it. So we have the clustering of the burr sound with it, vowel consonant. So tiger, tiger, burning bright in the forest of the night. In the sound night, we have the cluster of consonant, cons na, and then we have it. So these sounds are combined. Consonant, I is a vowel, and then t. So bright and night, they are coupled together. What immortal hand or I? I is a vowel sound. So it is not a masculine rhyme. And then we have the use of a word, symmetry. Symmetry is pronounced as symmetry. It does not have the sound of I at the end. Why is Blake using such a sound when he has so many words? What immortal hand or eye could frame thy fearful? He could have used some other word except symmetry because symmetry does not sound as symmetry. So there is a conscious phonological foregrounding through deviation. And Blake perhaps wants to foreground the feature of the tiger shaped in a fearful symmetry. So something symmetrical is unnatural. Nature does not create shapes in symmetry. Nature has its own creative ability to produce different shapes, but the shapes are not compassed. So these are not Newtonian shapes or geometrical shapes that are created by human beings. But the shapes that are in symmetry usually are also fearful in Blake's poem. So the iron forge that is there at the center, creating the image of the tiger, is related to this creation of fearful symmetry. So the tiger is a product not of nature, but of artificial creation forced in the iron mills, the satanic mills of England. So Blake is making an overt commentary to the phonological foregrounding. So we also have trisyllabic rhyme in lines like that. So trisyllabic rhyme in which three syllables rhyme. So take her up tenderly, tenderly, fashion so slenderly, tenderly, tenderly, slenderly. So these are rhyming. So we have the trisyllabic rhyme, internal rhyme. So not only the last sound that we find in the end rhyme, but also the trisyllabic rhythmic parallelism or the rhyming of the sounds. Other types of rhyme include I rhyme in which the syllables are identified in spelling, but are pronounced differently. In the spelling, you can identify the similarity, but there is no kind of similarity in the sound produced by the words. So T-R-Y, E-Y, E. They do not appear to the, be the same, but they produce the same. Try I, same sound. But there are also words that appear to be similar, but sound differently. For example, word like cuff, spelt as C-O-U-G-H, or 
slau s l o u g h is the spelling but the sound is au slau so kaf and slau they do not form a proper rhyme so these type of rhymes that appears to be the same but do not in the sound form match these are called i rhyme there is also the use of the para rhyme so this type of para rhyme was first used systematically by the 20th century poet wilfred darwin so in which two syllables have different vowel sounds but identical penultimate and final consonantal grouping so two types of vowel sounds are used not identical but the end consonantal sound in the end rhyme is same like for example grand and grind so these two words rhyme because the words end with d sound but just before the consonantal sound you do not have the same vowel sounds so this is a kind of weak type of rhyming rhyme occurs when the relevant syllable of the rhyming word remains unstressed say for example in the words like bend and frightened so we have the rhyming word that is actually in the word frightened unstressed we know that rhyme scheme that we have studied in our ug courses is a formal arrangement of rhymes in which in a stanza or a poem this type of rhyme scheme is usually presented with lower case letters so the first sound will be represented by a the second sound new sound will be represented by b the third new sound will be represented by c and so on so when you have to write about the rhyme scheme of the stanza that is given for stylistic analysis you should write in the lower case letters say a b b a a b b a c d e c d e the traditional sonnet stanza that is used by shakespeare so each different letter presenting a different rhyme there are certain types of rhyme scheme what are these rhyme schemes i have already talked about this the most prominent rhyme scheme that is used is the couplet form when the last words of two successive lines are rhymed together so this usually a couplet is marked with the sound a a in this way the poem say by langston hughes the passing of love so he is writing using the same couplet form because you are to me a song i must not sing you over long because you are to me a prayer i cannot say you everywhere because you are to me a rose you will not stay when summer goes so here we have the use of two rhymes in the consecutive lines called couplet we also have triple rhymes the structure will be a a a so the use of triple lines can be seen in lines like this wood of poplar pale as moon bean wood of oak for yoke and barn bean wood for horn bean silver bark of beech and hollow stem of elder tall and yellow twig of willow so counting out rhymes we also have cross rhymes so as in the ballads we have the use of the cross rhymes so we have the structure of rhyme where ab ab structure is used say in the sonnets of shakespeare also we have the quatrains following this type of structure when to the sessions of sweet silent thoughts i summon up remembrance remembrance of things past i sigh the lack of many a things i sought with old woes new veil my dear times waste so we have the repetition of sa sound in the first line and the third line ta sound in line number 2 and line number 4 so this is called cross rhymes we also have the framing of the ring rhymes so the structure will be a b b a a b b a so an ominous across the bridge trolls like a yellow butterfly and here there a passer by shows like a little restless smidge so the structure is a b a a b b a so this is called the framing or the ring rhyme so the first sound matches with the fourth so this has also been used in the ballad stanzas now we come to the word rhythm rhythm is again an important word in phonological analysis rhythm in verse or prose is a movement 
or sense of movement communicated by the arrangement of stressed and unstressed syllables and by the duration of the syllables. Usually rhythm is considered to be a characteristic feature of poetry. Prose also can have rhythm. So we can have a distinctive rhythm in prose. The rhythm of a prose passage is created by the prominent sentence structure. Long sentences with several subordinate clauses. So as we find in so many lines of say Charles Lamb or Thomas Lodge, we have the use of such rhythmic lines that is produced by the conjunctions created by a slow flowing rhythm. Even the short simple sentences can accelerate the pace of the rhythm. So we can find this use of prosaic rhythm, especially in case of the dramatic text. So I turned back, I opened the door, I went towards the hall, I went to the cupboard, I left the stairs. So short lines are being used to produce a similar rhythm. And this rhythmic parallelism is of course, based on the phonological constituents of a line. Usually in English, we have the predominance of the iambic rhythm. In the natural, normal, day-to-day -day conversational language, we of course use this rhythmic parallelism by the use of the iambic meter. So the prosaic language also appears to be rhythmic in English language. In case of poetry, this is more conscious and the rhythm is produced by the use of the sounds in such a form that it will produce the desired effect on the mind of the readers. So the effect of rounding up the sound or the, the repetition of the same image in Jalper to Fock is produced with this rhythmic parallelism. In the room, women come and go, talking of Michael and Jello. This is, of course, a rhythmic line composition that is used as a refrain in the poem. A statement that is made by the Prufok, I grow old, I grow old, I shall be at the bottoms of my trousers rolled. The repetition of the the sound at the end produces a kind of rhythm. And this rhythm is related to the rhythm produced by the previous lines. In the room, women come and go, talking of Michael and Jello. Even if you count the number of syllables in the lines, you find that these are composed in such a proper way. Finally, I will conclude this class with a reference to the prosodic elements, metrical compositions. So we know that in English, we have different meters, iambic meter, trochaic meter. So trochaic, trochae is a metrical foot consisting of one stressed syllable followed by an unstressed syllable. As in the line, tiger, tiger, burning bright in the forest. So we have the trochaic rhythm. Twinkle, twinkle, little star using trochaic rhythm. When you observe the works of William Shakespeare, especially a text like Macbeth, we find the use of trochaic meter, especially with relation to the sounds produced by the witches, which has belonged to the supernatural realm. And whenever they speak on the stage, they speak in the trochaic meters in order to show the distinction between the trochaic rhythm, trochaic meter, and the iambic meter used by the other characters. Most of the characters speak in ordinary iambic meter. In blank verse, the characters deliver the dialogues, but the witches are given the trochaic meter to create that uncanny supernatural atmosphere. Fear is foul, foul is fair, hover through the fog and fill the air. So double, double toil and trouble, thrice to mine and thrice to thine, thrice suck in to make up nine. So this trochaic meter is unnatural meter, but consciously used by the poets in order to create that metrical desire to create the sensation of supernaturalism and arrest the attention of the readers. So we have the use of iambic natural rhythm, dactylic, in dactylic, we have the patterning of an unnatural sound. So we have cannon to the left of them, cannon to the right of them, producing a kind of dactylic rhythm consisting of a stressed syllable followed by two unstressed syllables. We also have anapistic. Again, anapistic meter is very common in English language because it, it uh, simply follows the iambic pattern of two unstressed syllable and one stressed syllable. So in the poems, we have the use of the anapistics. For example, in Byron's The Destruction of Senar Cherib, the Assyrian came down like a wolf on the fold and his cohorts were gleaming in purple and gold. So these are two patterns that are used, iambic and the anapistic together in most of the lyrical poems in English language. 
So phonological analysis will conclude, will include all these different aspects of phonological composition. So I end my lecture with this. We can open the house for discussion. If you have any question, you can ask.